Hey guys, welcome to this week's episode of the Money and Investing Show. This week we are discussing one of the scariest statistics I think I've ever seen, and that is a scenario that's facing over 9 million Australians right now, and that's one of financial hardship. We can go through a little bit in this interview. It's pretty heavy because so many people there are in a dark space where they need help, they need a game plan to get out of it. And there's plenty of great content in this podcast to take out of it. So make sure you take plenty of notes. But as always, please do make sure you take plenty of action. See you in the show. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money in Investing show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter. And as always, my offsider and co-host, Mitchell Lorenzo. Good to be here, Mr. B. Now, sitting down, we are usually pretty comfortable with one another, but my plan of attack is to scare you today. Another great said way. Today, we're going to be talking about the scariest Australian statistic that we've seen in a long, long time. And specifically, we're talking about household finances and savings. And what we're about to share is pretty damning. It is. So they came across the newswire last week uh, and it came from a, a company called Finder, which is an independent research company. And the statistic was really simple. Nine million Australian households or people have less than $1,000 in savings. It's about 45% of the population. It, it, which is a terrifying, terrifying statistic on every measure. And and, and look, it, 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 that, that figure has come about for various reasons, which I'm sure we'll explore as we go through. The reality is it just points to one simple thing, which is a total failure of financial education, the teaching of financial literacy, and perhaps more scarily, is that inability to provide people with an optimistic outlook for their future, which which is just which is it, it, it is just terrible. And I, I looked at that. I've been chewing over this all weekend, and it got me really fired up. I'll be honest with you, uh, because it's so avoidable and so unnecessary. So we'll look at some of the factors I'm sure that have contributed to it. And as always, to quote my my wonderful father, never ever talk about a problem without coming up with a way of fixing it. So I'm sure we'll there's nice. solutions in there as well. So good little structure. You've done my work for me early. Thank you, AB. So if we dive into these statistics a little bit more, so mm. less than $1,000 in savings for 45% of the population. Mm. Now, on average, the savings that were in that category was about $210. Yeah. Uh, lacking uh, of savings is, is, is such a financial poison chalice for people in so many ways. And look, let's preface this. We live in an economy at the moment which has got a cost of living crisis. And, and the financial stress that comes from being in a week-to-week -week situation, I've been week-to-week, -week, it's not nice. Um, you know, you run out of money before you run out of month, and, and, and you know, it's, it's not a pleasant position to be in. So I'm very, very aware uh, of what that feels like, having been in it and seen plenty of my family members in that. It is something that's fixable. It is something that's avoidable. And I think what we've got to look at are perhaps some of the causes for it. And it's not just simply a cost of living. It's, it's behavior patterns as well. And as I pointed to just previously, it's that lack of optimism about what the future might be. So you've got people now that are just in a despondent situation. This is my lot in life. I've got no money. I'm struggling financially. Life is not good. There's just no way to live. And, and as I say, it is fixable. Absolutely. Specifically, you know, when we talk about that kind of attitude, 20% of those people, according to Finder, have $0 yeah. in savings, which poses many, many risks. So let's explore those now. First things that come to my mind would be credit cards, personal loans, buy now, pay later. It's an easy trap for people to fall into. There is an abundance of uh, willingness to lend you money on, I'm going to just call it what it is, an unconscionable basis that you don't realistically have any ability to service that. You're going to be buying stuff that adds no real value to your life. And particularly in the buy now, pay later space, which we've talked about many, many, many times uh, throughout this podcast series, is that it's, to all intents and purposes, predatory lending uh, in that you're allowing people to buy stuff they can't afford by spreading it out over three, four, five, six payments uh, without doing credit checks in the case of some buy now, pay later companies and, and without really putting any, um, any, any handbrake on there until people do get into financial difficulty, which then happens and we see people go into personal loans to try and pay off their buy now, pay later or sacrificing eating meals in order to pay off their buy now, pay later uh, purchase that was so convenient for them. We think the average household spends about $220 a week on groceries. Now, if you've only got $1,000 in savings in your account, you've got about four to five weeks, basically, of just groceries, not even including rent or anything like that. Yep. When we talk about the cost of living, AB, this is a risk that every Australian faces. Yeah, well, look, but, in that cost of groceries, I'd, I'd, I'd give my right arm for that in my household with five kids. It's, uh, oh, yeah, I'd it's hate to see your belt. But, you know, that's the reality for most people, and and and... What, what are some of the things that you can do to make some inroads in there, I suppose, will be a good thing to talk to because you have to eat. Uh, people need need food. We get that. 
Um, and, and I think, you know, with that, it, it's so easy to generalize and pillory people that are in financial difficulty. And that's not the purpose of this. And I'll say this now, and I'll say it several times through it. Listening to this podcast today with us, please share this podcast with as many people as you can, because there are 9 million people out there that need to be listening to this. Absolutely. So you've got your groceries. Number one, uh, you know, is where do you shop and why do you shop there? And and there are choices in Australia. We've seen, you know, the ACCC go through the two monopolistic or duopolistic supermarket chains, Coles and Woolies, you know, with a fine tooth comb and shown some of their um, practices aren't necessarily in the consumer's best interest. Um, you know, there's a third player uh, where you can, which is definitely cheaper, uh, being Aldi. And you go and cut some of your grocery costs there, but also... And I know this sounds crazy to suggest it is, is, is grow some food at home. It's not that hard. And you might say, well, I live in an apartment. Okay, I live on a farm. So my circumstances are a little bit different. But if you've got an apartment, grow some herbs, grow some tomatoes on the balcony, grow some lettuce on there if it's stuff yeah. that you consume. And, and you know, a, a, a dollar that is saved is a dollar profit for you effectively. And if your margin of existence is so thin, every dollar counts. Um, you know, have a look at where, uh, and I guess what we've drifted into here subconsciously is, of course, budgeting. And that's knowing where your money goes. Uh, most people have got an idea, but they don't know the specificity of it. And the devil with this sort of thing is is in the detail. Where, where does your money go? And sitting down and looking at the actual weekly budget that you have and where your money is spent is, I would say, in our experience, one of the most sobering things you can do with people. Oh, gee, I, I, I didn't realize I spent that much on that. And that's something that you can then target as an area to maybe reduce if it's, say, uh, a coffee, uh, buy a coffee up, buy a jar of instant, soldier on, get through it and, and save that extra money if, if you're in such a, a thin position uh, where you only got a couple hundred dollars in the bank account. So save money where you can on those things. Eating out, maybe cook a little bit more the night before and bring leftovers the next day. Um, it saves money. Uh, and, and these sorts of things are crucial world-class basics that can slow that spending down, which is half of the equation. But certainly having a, a budget with good tools we can help people with that you know, is, is, is absolutely crucial. So about incomes. Now, we look at the median average earning in Australia. It's about 98 grand is what the, the average mm. wage is at the moment. Now, that may have used to sound like a lot, but really in the current climate, it's not. So we talk about side hustles and getting your income up to help mm. supplement. What routes would you suggest in your experience? But there, there are plenty of things that you can do on the side hustle um, area of things. And look, to be clear, what we mean by a side hustle is, okay, if you are tight for cash, which 9 million people are, uh, look at the hours you work through the week. And I know some people work huge hours and are still struggling week to week, and I understand that totally. There'll be others that maybe aren't doing as many hours at work and are struggling. And it's how can you utilize that, top, that time that you have to convert it into more dollars for your household income? So a side hustle could be, let's say you wash cars on a weekend or you do some um, landscape gardening. Uh, and if you've got no skills, be a laborer for a landscape gardener and get paid X an hour for assisting in that space. Yeah, that's a fairly unskilled task uh, that just about anybody can do. And really sit down and think, well, okay, what, what skills do I have? What are my interests? And how can I parlay that into something I can get paid for? Maybe it's babysitting or childcare if you've got a blue card and you've got an interest in looking after kids. Um, you know, go, go teach swimming if you're into your swimming and you've got a coach's badge uh, and converting that spare time that you have, which may sound no fun, go, oh, that's my leisure time, that's my downtime. But if you're week to week and you've only got a couple hundred bucks in the bank account, you're at crisis point. You don't need me to tell you that. You know this because every week you run out of money before you run out of week. I know I've been there. And it's how can you get yourself out of that immediate crisis and, and, and probably the deepest and, and fullest world that people can can dip into is using some of their time up and trying to convert that into dollars in some way, shape or form. Look, I, I, I do this with my kids and, you know, my kids have got, you know, substantially more in the bank account than, 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 than 9 million Australians. And it's not because we're rich and we give them pocket money. I absolutely wholeheartedly disagree with the concept of pocket money in its true sense. What I've encouraged my, particularly my elder two, um, and the middle one that's starting to now is, I call it enterprise value. It's very official. And for them, it's about ingraining attitudes and behaviors around money. And it may be that the, the money challenge and, and perhaps one of the reasons that you're in crisis at the moment 
and I'm not saying this to talk down or be condescending, but the last thing I'd do could be because of some of the money habits that you've inherited from your family, potentially, or you've just built some bad habits under your own steam, either or. And what I consider enterprise value to be is that the kids have all got chores. You know, we've got five kids. It's a busy household. They all help out in their own way with different things. You know, you feed the dogs or the cats or whatever it may be. Look out, you know, different things of that nature. And, and that's the baseline of their responsibility. Keep your room tidy, help with the clear up after dinner, all that sort of stuff. That, it covers their rent at home. Well, as all kids, <laughs> that's what we do is to help out with the efficient running of a house. Right? Yeah. And then what I've created are some 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 subtasks that that align to my kids' interests. So, for example, my daughter Charlotte, she's got horses, and part of what I have her do is clear her paddock of horse poo, which is someone that keeps horses. She's going to do anyway, but I've tried to reinforce that and make it a win-win for her. So, I have an organic farm down at Byron, and so for me, manure, horse poo is a really important ingredient for fertilizer. So, you know, you don't, you, you've actually, there's a few things you've got to compost, you've got to break down, there's a whole process over there. But I don't particularly want to go and steal her business from her by getting the tractor and driving around clearing it all up because it's something that she wants to do to look after her horses. But I'll incentivize her financially. Why? Because it's good for me. It's given me a source of nitrogen for my farm. So I'll pay her for doing that. She's exchanging her time for effort. So it's reinforcing to her that when you put in effort, there's the potential for a reward, a reward for it. And financially, she's going along very, very nicely on the back of it. She's really canny uh, with her money. She is a prolific saver. So for her, I match. So if she saves, I'll match it. That's a form of interest and it's conditioning that when you have uh, cash and savings, it earns interest. So you get a return on that. So I, I kind of match that and help reinforce that notion of an investment return for us. She's only nine at the moment, so it's very, very early days. But I think at the, early, at the same time, she's old enough to understand what we're doing and it is ingraining some really good habits there. He might say my son, Jack, uh, he's, he's a little different. He wants to, he's mini me. He wants to be on the farm doing different things with me. So one of the many things we have, we've got some chickens. And so we sell eggs. He'll help me with the chickens through the week. And so the deal I have with him is on Saturday, he's got a little market store on the side of the road and there's an honesty box there. And so whatever we sell on a Saturday is his in terms of the proceeds from his return on labor, helping me with, with the chickens through the week. And again, you know, these are very basic things, but what it's done is join the dots for them that they could do a number of things. He could go ride his motorbike. He could be running around on his bike, scooter, Jigsaw puzzle, you yeah, can't do something whatever, to do with yeah. time. But he chooses to put that little bit of extra time, might only be 15 minutes a day, to, to assist me with the management of the poultry. And in return, he's making X amount per week. Great. Now, he's different. His person, he's very generous. He'd give you the shirt off his back. So, you know, he's always lending or he doesn't lend. He just gives it. So he's really generous. And he hasn't quite got the second part of the equation yet of retaining a little bit because his his personality type is is a very generous personality type where he just, you know, oh, you need some money here. I went out with him on Saturday to do something. So what are you doing? And he's, and he's got this little bag with his money in, in his pocket. I said, what's that? He said, oh, that's my money. I said, what, what for? He said, oh, so I can buy you something. I said, you don't need to buy me anything, son. You know, you're a good boy. I'll get you something. That's, that's and, 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 and so that's his personality type. But again, what they've understood is the enterprise value that, if they put in extra effort outside of the norm, there's something that comes back that way. So how does that translate into real life for people? Well, if you've got a, a job Monday to Friday and, and you're doing your 40 hours a week, which is what most people would have, um, you've still got probably 20 hours, 30, maybe even 35 hours a week you could quite easily carve out to invest in a sideline of some sort without it having, you're not missing sleep, you might miss a lot of TV, you might miss a lot of scrolling, um, but he, he, they're, they're not necessarily negatives by missing out on that thing and then translating that time into some sort of enterprise value. Hey, come in. We, we, we've got a client that's, that's doing only fans, and I'm not advocating that, but there are so many opportunities that are out there for people yeah. to increase the income. So on one level, we've talked about budget and getting that under control, which is essential, and, and a lot of people just don't know how to do that. You know, Get rid of the credit card, get rid of buy now, pay later, get your debt paid off. Start to save. Well, how can you save if you're week to week? You need to increase the income sides. That does require either a pay rise at work, a different job, or keep the job you've got and get a side hustle 
that's going to do something that's going to bring some income in. Put those two things together and you're in a position where the balance of scale starts to shift and you then start to have more money than weak to get through. And that's where you can start to build that buffer out, if you will, of having an emergency fund of a month's worth of expenses. And the goal, of course, is, is to get you to three months of expenses saved up on the side. So if something happens in life, it's just a speed bump in the road rather than the crater that you fall into. Gotcha. It all comes back to personal finance in the end, doesn't it? Having a plan, adding value, budgeting, saving, and then ultimately getting to the stage where you can invest. I mean, unashamed plug wealth playbook goes through exactly that, right? But that's one of the reasons some of the first seven, eight chapters of the book um, is dedicated toward exactly that. And then the book is called The Wealth Playbook. Get it.com.au, go onto Amazon, go onto uh, Audible or wherever you want to get your book from. And, and, and some people that are cynical, and that's fine if you're cynical listening to this, or oh, you're just saying all this stuff so you can plug your book. Let me assure you, you don't get rich selling a book. Number two, I'm already rich. I don't need to make money selling a book. What we've got here is a, is a message and a very practical system that's proven over and over and over and over again to better help take people from a situation of financial hardship to the ability to literally just come and get some fresh air in their lungs and get their head above water. And, and that stress, and I can't, I can't emphasize this enough. I'm not sat in an ivory town. I have lived that. I know what it feels like, and it's awful. But you can make a choice. And that choice is, do I just stay living this way and existing week to week, hoping that things might change? Or do I try something different? And I can assure everyone listening to this that follow the steps in that book. They're very practical, they're very simple, they're microscopic in terms of commitment, but they layer up. It'll, it'll help get you out of that situation. And when you hear the horror statistic that 9 million people have got less than $1,000 saved up, Crazy. it's terrifying. And it doesn't have to be that way. And I think it points more than anything to, to an absolute failure within our system. And I know it's always good to oh let's pass the block let's pass the buck and blame blame somebody else for this, but this kind of stuff's not taught at school, where it should be. It's a life skill. It should be taught at school. It's it's not really taught out and about because the financial services industry is very opaque. It talks in code and jargon. The fees are high and unpalatable for many people, so it's not an access point that they can get into. So if you're not taught it at school and there's nowhere to go after school, it's not surprising to see people falling foul of some of the traps that are there, such as we've talked of, buy now, pay later, credit card, personal loan, just bad debt in general. It's no wonder that so many people, 9 million people in fact, end up there. And yes, we, we do have a cost of living crisis and, and help from the government isn't going to fix that because every dollar of subsidy just causes more inflation. It doesn't actually fix the problem. It's down to each individual under their own steam just to make a very simple decision or commitment that that's it, I am not living this way anymore and I'm prepared to roll the sleeves up and do what it takes to get myself out of this situation. And by having a resource that's reliable, practical, that's not in jargon, that's easy to follow, that's practical, is going to give them that guide to get themselves out of that. And I go back to what I said earlier uh, in the interview, Mitch, and, and, and call it a plug or call it, Guys, if you need help, this is where to go. Get a copy of the book. And if you've got less than a couple hundred bucks or, or, or less than a thousand dollars in the bank, you say, I can't go and afford it. Yes, you can and you have to because the story you're telling yourself as to why you can't afford to buy a book that you can either listen to via Audible if you're not a reader or read, the story you're telling yourself why you can't afford it is exactly the reason why you have to have this because nothing is going to change in the next six to 12 months for you other than the cost of living is going to keep going up and you're going to feel that you're getting left further and further behind, particularly if we see Australia slide into yeah, a Chinese-led recession, for example. It's terrifying, and it is a failing on the part of the system. And as, as, as an organisation, you know, I'm very proud to say that we've, we've been at that front line of financial education literacy now for almost 25 years. And then when I see 9 million people in that situation, I realise that we've failed in our mission to help people because there's 9 million people people in our great country today that need help that we haven't yet been able to get to and give the practical skills, the tools, the support, the advice, the encouragement, um, the game plan to get themselves out of the fix that they're in. 
indeed very scary stuff ab but hopefully this offers our listeners a really good insight share this message guys please i'm not it's, 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 I, I don't sit here and plug this for the sake of it like i said i'm not gonna get rich out of this i'm already there but the reason i'm there is because i've applied the stuff that's in that book as thousands and thousands of clients of ours have to achieve not just financial success in terms of accumulating wealth, but to get themselves out of that hole that they might be in. And no one deserves to live under that. But at the same time, there is a level of responsibility that goes with people that we've all got to be responsible for our own backyard. And if you're in that situation, get stuck into that game plan and it'll give you a pathway out because it feels so dark and so lonely and so stressful when you're sat up at night worried about bills. And how am I going to deal with this? And gee, there's, there's so much you can do. And I, I really hope this message resonates. And it's with a very heavy heart. There's normally a level of, you know, joviality and banter in these podcasts when we talk about this sort of stuff. But I think it's just so sobering that we can live in what is one of the greatest countries on the planet. And yet 40% of our population are left floundering in the dark on their own with no way out. And it really doesn't have to be that way. So get a copy of the book, guys. Indeed. Thank you very much, AB. Pleasure. Anytime. There you have it, guys. Make sure you leave us a review and a rating. And most importantly, please do share this podcast with as many people as you can to help them get themselves on the front foot financially. We'll look forward to seeing you next week.